Mr. Diamond, how much did J.P. Morgan collect in overdraft fees from their consumers in 2020? Well, I, you're, I think your numbers are totally inaccurate, but we'll have to sit down privately and so go through these that. These are public numbers. And I also, I also want to point out we did not overdraft. Can, can you just account. answer my question? And, and How much, in fact, did and, J.P. And, and Morgan did. collect in overdraft fees from their customers in 2020? Do you know the number? And that, uh, obviously, Senator Elizabeth Warren going after J.P. Morgan CEO Jamie Dimon at yesterday's hearing. Uh, lawmakers from both sides of the aisle criticize the big banks for everything from their business models to their stance on social issues. Joining us now is Anthony Scaramucci, founder of Skybridge Capital and a CNBC contributor, and Alexis Goldstein, senior policy analyst uh, at Americans for Financial Reform. What, uh, Alexis, I'll start with you. What would you like to see reformed, and what did we see yesterday that, that bears out uh, what needs to be done, in your view? So I think one of the things we saw in the pandemic last year was the regulators relaxed the rules for the largest banks, including their capital requirements, in order to encourage them to lend to the broader economy and help kickstart us as we were all struggling with the pandemic. And we did not actually see the big banks up their lending. We saw community banks increase their lending to the economy. But what the big banks seemed to do is sort of keep their powder dry until the Fed allowed them to do buybacks again later on in the year. And then the minute that they were allowed to do that, that's exactly what they did. And so we didn't see the sort of increase from the big banks into lending into the broader economy. And that, in my opinion, is because there weren't conditions, more conditions placed on some of the corporate bond market rescues, on some of the unprecedented interventions. And I think that was a focus of a lot of the lawmakers, right? Are you going to remain neutral in any union organizing? No big bank CEO said yes to that. They all said no in various different ways. And so I think that lawmakers are really interested in ways to make sure that companies aren't leaving workers behind and only enriching their shareholders when they receive this kind of unprecedented support in emergency times like we did during the pandemic. You during a pandemic, you would expect lending to go down as, as people don't take risk and, and pull their, uh, their horns in in terms of, uh, of, of trying to, you know, actively expand or any of the things that are done. I mean, in a really difficult time, that would be tough. And there are a lot of people, there were, there were uh, other ways, perhaps, of, of getting some funding. Is, is, it, it didn't happen in a vacuum. Uh, do you think that the banks actually tightened up their lending? Alexis? Well, co the community banks did, and community banks increased their lending. And the very reason that the Fed took the steps they did to waive some of the rules and relax them was to stimulate the big banks to lend. But that isn't what we saw. We also saw this sort of separation about the way the corporate bond market was rescued, but municipalities weren't really able to access some of the emergency facilities that the Fed set up. They didn't ask corporations whether or not the Fed should buy their bonds. They just went ahead and did it, whereas the municipalities had to sort of opt in. They had to to meet certain credit requirements. And so I think this is just another illustration of the sort of K-shaped recovery, mm. where we see the most biggest, most powerful companies having a wonderful recovery while Main Street is still struggling, black unemployment is still really high. So I think our policies do still need some tweaking to make sure that any economic recovery benefits everybody and not just the top. Anthony, if, if you get offered a CEO job at both, at either a bank or an oil company, um, which one, uh, which one would you um, take? Uh, well, would you decline I'm taking for you, both of I'm taking you with me, Joe. You're going to be my <laughs> chief of staff, okay? okay? You and I are going to work it all out with those guys. But It's rough. It's, it's a, a rough uh, environment. I think it paid a lot of money. I mean, I, I, let's, let's, let's be honest. But that was, uh, they, they, were, they got it from both sides yesterday, Anthony. Yeah, well, listen, I mean, uh, Jamie Dimon's lucky that Homeland ended, you know, they had their season finale in season eight because he was auditioning for a hostage video in the season nine of Homeland. <laughs> I think it's totally unfair the way they're being treated. And I, I get the fact that they're fat cats, and I get the fact that there's a rise of systemic populism. But we've got to step back, and we have to recognize that we're in a capitalist society, and they are empowered to take care of their shareholders, and they're empowered to look after their customers and, both, and by the way, thank God for this society because we have massive competition going on for these banks. And so if you're not happy with your overdraft fees to some of those major banks, you can move to the neo-banking community. You can move into places like Chime, uh, which are going to give you lower fees, lower overdraft fees, higher interest rates. And I think what Senator Warren is missing about the society, and I get her constituency, and I understand the theater, the kabuki theater that we have to play in the Senate banking testimonies. 
Uh, you know, I got an 11 day PhD in how Washington works. But I think it's wrong, and I think it's wrong for the banking community. If you want to change the entire society and go back, Joe, go back to 2008, uh, where the banks did collapse, no question about that. They're still in PTSD 13 years later, and they have to operate with great conservatism. One last point on the community banks, it's a totally different story. They're not viewed from the stress testing point of view from the Federal Reserve in terms of creating a systemic collapse. And so they had way more latitude uh, post-crisis and way more latitude during the pandemic. Well, Alexis, I just think it's important to remember that banks wouldn't exist without government charters. Banks wouldn't exist without FDIC banking. And it's really not very much to ask them to come before Congress and ask some basic accountability questions. Banks meet with Congress all the time behind closed doors in private with their lobbyists. And I think the public deserves to know what the CEOs are going to say in response to Congress, because, again, banks wouldn't exist without the unprecedented levels of, of government support that we offer through the charters, through the FDIC insurance. And so this isn't just about 2008. This is about all of the regulatory relaxation that happened in the wake of the pandemic. And Congress has some really good questions about whether or not the relaxing of those regulations worked. And I would argue that they didn't. Shepard Smith here. Thanks for watching CNBC on YouTube.